Movie Talk is back, and today we're digging into some Endgame spoilers, in particular, talking about time travel. On top of that, we got a big announcement from Disney today. It is their post-Disney Fox merger release calendar. There is so much to explore. We got a whole bunch of franchises to hit in this conversation, and I am so excited to be at this desk right now, and in particular, talking about these two stories with two of the guys that I think have the most energy on this planet. If you saw either of our social promos for this episode, <laughs> Koi and Mans. Uh, energy? Ben and Stein. What? We're what? very calm. What are you talking about? We're just tame. We're oh, boring. Come on. Very lackluster. You know why we have energy? Out. You know why we have energy? <laughs> Spider Bros? Because you are running this show here, Perry Perry Collider, Collider, Movie Talk. Paranormal activity is great activity. I just feel all the vibe. It's just so much hype. Energy. Every, everyone's been too supportive already. I feel like I'm redder than usual and now I, I knew this was going to happen today especially with you Come on the desk on. Yeah, it's great to be here with you pal all right we got to jump stories. into it right now and we're going with that avengers endgame spoiler conversation and apparently there's no spoiler warning anymore because the russo said so <laughs> so according to the hollywood reporter during a q a at the freer gallery in washington dc directors joe and anthony anthony russo they spoke about the choice to have steve rogers stay in the past to be with peggy carter they there have been a whole bunch of questions regarding that particular decision and how it affects the time travel. For example, is Steve living way back when with Peggy while another Steve is in ice, or did he create an alternate reality? Here is what the Russos had to say about that. If you went back to that timeline between the point where Steve went into the ice in Captain America, the first Avenger, yet before Peggy met her husband, Peggy was available, Anthony Russo had said. <laughs> so now, just to switch it around a little bit, this is what the screenwriters, Marcus and Minfieli, had to say about it. That is our theory. We are not experts on time travel, but the Ancient One specifically states that when you take an Infinity Stone out of a timeline, it creates a new timeline. So Steve, going back in time and just being there would not create a new timeline. I'm hearing different things, and I'm very intrigued by this conversation, too, because when we did our spoiler review for Endgame, I said I had some questions about the time travel, and we never got to discuss this because there was so much else to discuss in Endgame, so I'm so happy we could talk about it now. Yeah. What say you guys? Whose side do you fall on, and maybe which do you want to be true? I'm team writer on this. Uh, I love the Russos. They've they've helped my nerd mind grow in ways I never thought possible. Yeah. But so did Marcus and McFeely. And for me, the visual of timeline return to timeline. For me, once you remove the stone, but once you put it back, it lines things back up. So for me, when Cap goes back, there is another Steve Rogers on ice in that very same time. And at some point, there are two Steve Rogers running around because the way they spell it out is if everything else is in alignment, then it should be fine to carry on as it was. For example, them killing Nebula. Nebula didn't go away. In this universe of timeline, butterfly doesn't exist. There is no butterfly effect. So him being in that timeline shouldn't cause a ripple to cause a new timeline because that timeline is its more of a location, right? So time and space. So what they're saying is that your present is your present no matter what. So if you're from the future and you go to the past, that past is now your present. So it's more about going to a location. So to me, it didn't cause a split because all of the stones are where they belong. So you're landing in a location which happens to be another time. So to me, one timeline. To me, I think Marcus McFeely's perspective is the one I share. I'm going with Marcus and McFeely too. One time, you know, your past is now your present. So, so this is where, this is the second time, actually probably the third time in Avengers Endgame that I thought about Star Trek because there was a lot of time travel in Star Trek in the TV episodes and definitely in the movies. So not only is Star Trek referenced in Avengers Endgame and not only does the uh, the sign off at the end with all the signatures, you know, that totally reminded me of Star Trek 6, The Undiscovered Country when all the original cast members signed off on the end credits. But back to the timeline scenario. So starting back in The Naked Time and Tomorrow's Yesterday and Sitting on the Edge of Forever and definitely with the J.J. Abrams reboot, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary this week. Wow. So when you go back in time, your present will affect the future. And without sounding too confusing, when Cap goes back in time, all the other Avengers who are in the present might not even realize that anything was changed because this is like their new reality. This is 
You know what I mean? This mm-hmm. is their new They normal. wouldn't know the old one because it doesn't exist because he's in the past. Right. He's in the past. But if, he, if he's careful and he doesn't make any changes, mm-hmm. and, and hopefully he was very cap, and he did that, and he sort of like kept, you know, kept it kosher and tried not to, not to make any changes or, or mess with the future. But if he did, then the present-day Avengers are not going to know that because their, their pasts have been altered and they don't even know about it. For example, in the Star Trek reboot, when the Romulan ship from the future went back in time, it screwed up. It, it created an alternate timeline. And, you know, you have this whole separate timeline. And that could happen with the MCU. We never know, although I doubt it. I doubt that's going to happen. I think we've seen the last of Robert Downey as Iron Man. But maybe not Chris Evans as Captain America. But the, this, this alternate timeline was created, and their destinies are, have been changed, and they'll never know. So I think that rule applies for Avengers Endgame. Did I make any sense whatsoever? No, totally. You did. I, I, I mean, you, just you both did. And I think all of all of their uh, statements make sense, too. And I feel bad. I cut the Russos off a little too early. <laughs> Sorry, it's, Russos. It's, it's, Sorry. Oh, well, it didn't fully explain it. They also said if Cap were to go back into the past and live there, he would create a branched reality. And then later on, they say, for example, the old Cap at the end of the movie, he lived his married life in a different universe from the, from the main one. He had to make another jump back to the main universe at the end to give the shield to Sam. While I can see some sense in that, it basically comes down to exactly what Marcus and McFeely said and what they laid out in their script. It's what the Ancient One says. The rules of the branching realities is strictly tied to the Infinity Stones, in which case I need to ask you guys the question, does Loki taking a stone even create a branch reality? Disney or Plus. I think yeah, that's the Plus show. But, but, but where, okay, but where did he go? If he just went to, let's say, Asgard or a different planet, isn't it still in that same reality so never created a branched universe? I think since he removes the stone from that reality, it creates a branched universe because that's no longer part of the timeline it's meant to be at. That stone is meant to be in the possession of S.H.I.E.L.D. at that time. When it leaves the possession of S.H.I.E.L.D., it is a causing a new reality, which is a large enough impact to cause a change, which would be an alternate reality, which I think is the entire basis so of the Loki like, show. That's the like Loki a bullet show. point like under their <laughs> big uh, their big infinity stone rule. Yes. Okay. So I feel like the Disney Plus show is the moment he ghosts out is that's where he travels through time. It creates alternate realities. That way you don't have to mess with canon. You don't have to mess with the continuity. Everything exists in its own zeitgeist through the Loki mm-hmm. show, but it doesn't affect the MCU over here. And I feel like Cap just waited and was waiting at that bench. I feel like Cap lived his life and then he knew they were going to be there because he was there. And then he's like, well, today's the day. And then he Forrest Gumped his way and just fucking hung out. Just throwing out his way to the bench. <laughs> Well, obviously he knew he knew what was going to happen. So that see, this is the thing, and that that brings up another point. Mm-hmm. So so if if he did sort of alter the timeline in any way, he must have known for sure that the timeline wasn't going to be messed up that much, and that the Avengers would still be there after returning the Infinity Stones. I mean, he's he still knows that that everything is going to work out. He's just not messing with it. So what? At least not in a big way. But then the whole thing with Loki. That's uh, a different show. Well, that yeah. is a whole other, <laughs> a whole other. So with the way question. they describe it, with or in particular Marcus and McFeely, that would mean that while our Cap from the main MCU timeline, who we've been following all along, while other Cap is still in ice, waiting for his time to be dethought and, jo- and join the Avengers, mm-hmm. he's quietly living a life with Peggy Carter. Look, look at it this way. Look at it this way. Look at it, the Planet of the Apes series. Not, not the newer versions with Andy Serkis. The original five films. Between classic Marky Mark film. What's that? The classic Marky Mark film. Yeah, the Planet of the Apes. Oh, God. That never happened, man. <laughs> that movie from 2000, that was uh, July of 2001. That was like the worst movie ever. Um, but no, the original uh, five films from the uh, 68 to 73. So, so to wrap your head around, you have to wrap your head around the paradox of time travel, which <laughs> is impossible according to Einstein. But... But so when Charlton Heston goes into the future, he goes 2,000 years into the future and he's on the planet of the apes. But his ship crashes and the other chimpanzees take his ship back to the 1971, you know, or the early 70s and create the planet of the apes. So by, by, the, uh, by the apes showing up in 1971 or the early 70s, whatever year it is in uh, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, 
they've established this timeline where there's going to be apes and Charlton Heston's going to show up and the apes will already have taken over. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. But in, in Cap's case, he knew to stay out of it, but he might have messed up something a little bit to the point where moving forward, you know, they could always pull a loophole that Cap changed this and that's why this other thing is now happening. What I feel like works is Agent Carter, he's married to her and they mm -hmm. never we never meet him. So it's a separate entity where that is our Cap. Chris Evans is at home yeah. as the husband and that all exists. But since things are running on parallel rails, there is another Cap, but since he's frozen, it lines up. And when he gets thawed in 2014, it doesn't affect us because that Cap never encounters that Peggy until she passes away. So you do think that Peggy's husband all along Was Steve has Rogers. been Steve Rogers. I do like that touch to it. Moving away from the specific of the timeline though <laughs> i'm curious to get your take on the idea that the directors and the writers feel different differently about this particular plot point you like it i love that because yeah. first of all you're talking about uh, a quartet here joe and anthony russo uh, marcus and mcfeely these guys have been working together on the very best Marvel movies. Uh, Winter Soldier, Civil War, Infinity War, and now Endgame. I mean, that, that doesn't include Ragnarok, the first Iron Man, <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> you know, first Guardians. We're doing okay. Um, but the four that they worked on are among the greatest MCU movies. And the fact that they had different ideas that they talked about after the fact, this mm -hmm. is all after the movie opened. And if they had different ideas, but yet they still pulled this out of their hat to, to work on these four That's movies. How dense That's they really are. amazing. To me, it's impressive that you can be so creatively flourishing and also have different perspectives and the movies still feel solid. It didn't right. feel disjointed. It didn't feel like a scenario where your writers and directors didn't agree. I walked out of the theater like they made the movie they wanted to make and they did. Right. Four different people made the movie they wanted to make. They just happened to see it differently. And I think good cinema is interpretive. I think Absolutely art, art is subjective, right? Yeah, so when I look subjective. at a piece of art, it should be this. And four of the creators making that art and then us having subjective opinions is the point. But can you just imagine, so so you get the, the Russo brothers and Marcus and McFeely in the room together. <laughs> and this is like after, you know, Avengers has made like $5 billion worldwide. So so they, you know, they go up to each other and they go, so, so let me get this straight. You know, the movie's already <laughs> done. And they're going to go to each other and they're going to say, so let me get this straight. So when you wrote that, this is what you meant? Because when, when I directed that, it, that's what you meant? this is what I meant. Ten you know, years from now, the right? round table is going to be fascinating. Oh my God. I cannot wait for that conversation. Wait for that conversation. Well, this is the exciting thing, and this is why I'm okay with it. Normally, I like everything to be like perfectly mapped out and easily explainable, but I kind of love the conversations that come from this. And the fact that the movie almost justifies multiple ways of thinking, it makes it all even more exciting. We have a whole bunch of people chiming in on the chat right now, <laughs> and we have... Akshu, who I think agrees with us here, or actually, no, this is the opposite. He says, I don't think Loki creates the branch because the stone wasn't taken out of the timeline, but rather moved within the timeline, which is actually where I stand, but that's not how you explained it, Koi. I feel like he goes to another time when he leaves that moment. We don't know where Loki lands. I don't think he lands in that time. I don't think he lands in 2012 or 2014 or wherever that was. I think he lands elsewhere and that launches the Disney okay. Plus show. Which we don't totally, know where he lands. Which is, which is totally possible. We don't know where that stands. And then we've got Emil saying, I think the Loki series is going to be in the past in the reality where he dies. I think no matter what, Loki is gone. In, in, in continuity, Loki's gone, so therefore he had to go to another time for Wait him to be alive. In main Wait MCU timeline. Correct. So if he died, if Loki died in Avengers Infinity War, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but Loki in 2000, what was it, 2014? Was when, that when he when he took the the stone and disappeared? Was Avengers 2012 or 14? 2012. 2012. The first one was 2012. Yeah. Uh, Winter so I, I was thinking Winter Soldier because of Robert Redford, uh, which was amazing. I love that moment. That was amazing. So, but if he did, if he takes it, it takes it and disappears, how is he going to die in 2018? You know what I mean? I don't so know. it has to be an alternate timeline in order way, for there to be is, two Lokis. This, this is a this is all great conversation. It's so confusing in the best possible way. Yeah, because yeah, it's it really exciting is. to talk about, it sure and is. it's and it's they achieve this kind of conversation while still making a very satisfying and fulfilling movie, and sure. that's really all I can ask for. Absolutely. Yeah. Right now, oh. I got to remind you guys that we are interacting with you guys the entire show. Dorian is on live chat duty, and he's sending me your thoughts and also your questions. So keep chiming in there. We really want to know what you think and. And also, we want you to know about all of the great programming coming to Collider. And right now, we've got a little clip from Heroes. 
Hi, I'm Amy Dallin, one of the hosts of Collider Heroes. And starting right now, you can catch our show at a new time and format. We're coming at you Tuesday nights with a new shorter Collider Heroes and a longer Collider Heroes podcast where Koi and I are going to talk your ears off. You already know that's coming. So make sure to go to YouTube, subscribe, and find us on the Collider Heroes podcast feed for all of that sweaty goodness. So you guys have us live right now, but later on there's another live show, a special event, because as we told you earlier, there was the big release date calendar update. So our duo from Rule of Two, they're going to be live and discussing the recently announced slash dated Star Wars movie. So tune in for that, 5 p.m. Pacific. Right now though, we're gonna discuss that stories ourselves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we need so much time because there's so much stuff to talk about. Just to give you a brief overview of some of the biggest stuff, I guess, that was announced. We have three Star Wars movies that were dated, December 2022, 24, 26. On top of that, we've got four Avatar movies dated. Some of them have shifted from their previous release dates. We have December 2021, 23, 25, and 27. They dated all the way to 27. On top of that, Disney has moved New Mutants off of its August 2019 release date and dropped it April 2020. Then on top of that, Gambit is gone from the schedule. So are three Fox Marvel titles that were somewhere in the mix. I think it was two in 2020, one in 21. They are gone from the calendar. And then on top of that, Steven Spielberg has his West Side Story movie dropping on December 18th, 2020. Oh boy, where to start here? Let's go. (laughs) Let's go with New Mutants because we've recently discussed this on the show, specifically with Jeff Snyder here, where he laid out a really kind of like (laughs) handy chart of all their possible routes. And I'm curious, Mance, because you were on that show, does this release date push change where you stand on that matter? Uh, It changes it a little bit because originally when we were doing that show was when it's you, me and Jeff, the FIC team, we were talking about having it pop up on either Disney Plus Mm -hmm. or having it open in February of 2020. So moving it to April of, two, mm-hmm. uh, of 2020, April 3rd, that's the weekend that Captain America Winter Soldier op- opened in 2014. It's a confident spot. The, it is a confident spot indeed, my mm-hmm. friend. And actually when Captain America Winter Soldier opened, that sort of pushed the summer movie season from the beginning of May into April. And that's why I like these last two Avengers movies. And Shazam and Shazam. everything else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that is a tremendous vote of confidence, but does that mean that they're gonna do reshoots? They got time. I have a bold prediction here. Okay. <laughs> think one it means they're going to do reshoots i think it means disney is going to put some disney money Mm. into this to make it the best possible movie it can be and Mm -hmm. they can also (laughs) i think if we are getting dark phoenix and they decide to cut off the fox version of the mutants there there is a way to rework what they have for new mutants into the mcu i think I'm what agreeing a great with you. theory. I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with you. That is a great theory. With a little icing on top. Yeah, okay. I think New Mutants is not just going to be our first foray into the Fox Marvel deal on screen, but the post credit scene will be tying in the mutants into the MCU as a greater whole, and that's why it's got the April release date. There you go. I think the X-Men are born April 3rd, and I think we <laughs> see what mutant takes place because the X-Men comics are beautiful in that they're separate teams all around, right? What, what, I think uh, this okay. is a good way to have a separate team that is going to be in continuity with Without sacrificing the movie or the MCU's Marvel Mutants. And, and also, you had, like you said, Perry, you had three other Fox Marvel mm-hmm. movies that were taken off the schedule completely, two in 2020 and one in 2021. Uh, so so by, by moving New Mutants to April of 2020, so I, I, I love your theory. I'm going with it. If I had a house, I'd bet the house that that's <laughs> what we're going to do. But at the same time, uh, I think that there should be a little bit of a space with regards to bringing like the X-Men into the MCU. Kevin Feige did say it's gonna be like a long time. Those mm-hmm. are his words. It's gonna be a long time before you see mm-hmm. an MCU actual X-Men title. Now, New Mutants, I mean, it's sort of X-Men. It's definitely in the X-Men u- universe so for sure, but I, I don't think that they're going to like, like reintroduce Wolverine and, and Cyclops and not Professor in a horror X. film. They won't you know, do it in that gonna, genre. I think they're gonna I think they're going to um, recast those characters and, and and reboot them just like they did with Tom Holland in uh, Spider Man Homecoming. But uh, 
Uh, I, but I love your theory. It's awesome. I think one of these dates is a Deadpool movie. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a Deadpool movie. I think movie that's how they do it. Let's not forget that they took those Fox Marvel movies off the calendar, but now we also have eight untitled Disney Marvel movies Which coming is, out. I think one of those is Deadpool 3. I think 3. It's, there's a good chance that those, some of them at least, a few of them maybe, might be what were originally Fox properties. Mm -hmm. but, but, the, but if they do that, let's say they, one of them is a Deadpool title. Are they going to make Deadpool 3? A PG-13 movie? No. no. I think it's going to be Marvel's... And they, they've spoken to that, that yeah. they recognize what that was. <laughs> they I, I think... Yeah. Well, that's, I, that's as much as I enjoyed the experiment that was Once Upon a Deadpool, I think the best thing that happened was it not doing well, yes. so Ryan Reynolds could go, hey, we tried. Like, I right. think that exists oh, so we can have an R-rated, yeah. yeah. See, this is what happens when you put you a family You tried to neuter me. Deadpool you already sewed my mouth shut once. That is not what... The, right, in 2009. Yeah. That movie was terrible. <laughs> and so was the character in that movie. That wasn't the character. Uh, it was Baraka. Yeah, Wolverine, we don't even acknowledge that. Acknowledge that. That's and not you canon. know what? They can leave Deadpool in R-rated territory because if this calendar proves anything, it's that... Disney, now Disney plus Fox, now has two major tentpole franchises that they believe are family-friendly winners that will dominate the December holiday for many, many years to, to come. come. 2027, you guys. We've got three Star Wars movies there, yeah. mm -hmm. and then also all the Avatar stuff. Before we jump into Avatar, though, I'm curious to get your take on this. Three Star Wars movies. We know that Benioff and Weiss are working on films, and so is Ryan Johnson. What are those movies? Is it one, the other, or are they working together? Benioff and Weiss. I'm going with them because they are crushing it. They have crushed it with Game of Thrones. Uh, Ryan Johnson, Last Jedi, mixed. I mean, uh, you know, the critics liked it, but mm -hmm. the fans... Are, are were v more divided on the Last Jedi than any other movie. I've since, never uh, seen a fandom that that polarizing yeah, and angry, yeah, and they, it was like a civil war. It was a very intense divide. Yeah, it was very. It, I felt bad for the guy. Yeah. I mean, you know, it wasn't that bad, but uh, it wasn't as good as it should have been either. Um, so I think maybe they will combine forces. That would be that would be smart. But I definitely think that whether they combine forces or not, they're going to lead towards uh, the, the, the peeps from Game of Thrones. I don't know if this is possible, but what I would love to see is Benioff and Weiss be the three films in theaters, and I want to see Ryan Johnson go to Disney+. Plus Because okay. I like Ryan Johnson when he's dealing with small budgets. I love I love Looper. I love Brick, which is like $7. I, yeah, love, yeah. I love his movies that are like contained. So I would love to see him do long-form Star Wars, and I would love to see that lead into Disney+, Plus and tie those worlds together. That's but, what I'd but like. But for Star Wars, this new trilogy, the question is... Like, how far after the events of Episode Nine do you think it'll take place? Because you know what? Here's what I think. Who, who Should... knows? I mean, why does it have to be in advance no, of... No, 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 no more prequel stuff. Let's let's dispense with the prequels. I don't know. Uh, no, Time's we've a had, I've had enough I think of prequels or offshoots. I think there's still room to play in that sphere as long as you're not adding on to the Skywalker saga. Curry, Koi, move, <laughs> move Star Wars forward. Move it forward. The problem with this new trilogy is that it's only been 30 years since Return of the Jedi and or the events of Return of the Jedi. It didn't move the Star Wars universe forward enough. In fact, it's a reboot of, of, the, of the original yeah. trilogy. You got the Kylo mentality. Like. Let the past die. Let, 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 let's just move. Here's what I would love to see happen. Move the Star Wars universe ahead a thousand years. A thousand years. Just put it way the hell out there and do something really new, really fresh. Have these guys start a brand new, fresh, totally new Star Wars series that's inspired by the, uh, the, uh, um, the ideals. I wouldn't Star even Wars. date it. I personally would just have it exist and not tie it to anything. Just, just have it exist in the universe. Get out of the Wars. way of the empire of, of, of all this and just do something brand new, something that is unexpected so we can really be surprised. You know, I, I think that that's sort of been a, a crux with this new trilogy. You know, The Force Awakens, uh, I enjoyed it very much, but it felt like they played it safe. Do you, you think know? Knights of the Old Republic is coming? Like, cause I, I, that's the other direction than you're saying, but I think well, that yeah. could tie in, like, you know, I just to... want to see, I just want to see, I, I want to be surprised. Yeah. I don't want it to be based on any of the books, any of the novels, you know, the standalone novels that they do. Just make it something completely different so that we can all discover 
a new Star Wars series. There is Brand so, new. There new. is so much meaty material, though, that they had in the EU that I don't know if it just gets kind of like relegated to that zone, never hits the big screen. I feel like that's a missed creative opportunity, but I'm always I'm always rooting for new, too. It's just there's a lot that has been done before, but has gone unutilized and undervalued that I don't think they should push it aside too quickly. But let's go into Avatar right now, because I know you got some serious thoughts on Avatar also, because, wow, right, we got these movies through 2027. But do we want them? That's the question. <laughs> that's your, your, your tweet. I'm, I'm curious what yeah. this tweet is. We want four Avatar movies between 2021 and 2027. The reason I asked that question is this. So when Avatar 2 opens in 2021, it will have been 12 years since the first movie. Now you could argue, well, it's been all those years between episode four and episode mm -hmm. one, and then between episode three and, and episode seven, you know, for, for Star Wars I'm talking about. But Avatar was one film. So last week on Thursday, I was sitting at lunch and I happened to, it, on Twitter, I always tweet about the box office. So I put out a tweet about how uh, Avengers was at, at $1.7 billion worldwide, and that was last Wednesday, and how it was going to pass Avatar as the highest grossing movie of all time in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. It got retweeted 16,000 times, which I couldn't believe, but the point is, is that the comments on my original tweet and the quotes on the retweets were like, man, Avatar sucks. Oh, I hate Avatar. I couldn't tell you a thing about Avatar. Now, there were comments of people who loved Avatar. I loved Avatar. I thought it was a lot of fun, but I'm glad that Hurt Locker won Best Picture. But so the majority of the comments and the retweets were, thank God, this movie does not deserve, Avatar does not deserve to be the, the highest grossing movie of all time. I couldn't believe my eyes as I was scrolling and scrolling and reading these comments, all these people who didn't like Avatar. I am hesitant to say that. I am not the biggest Avatar fan out there, but I think there's a whole bunch of things that that movie achieved that warranted that. And it was also a completely different time. We're also talking about a December release versus yeah. let's say with Endgame right now as a summer release with so much competition ahead sure. of it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to these movies, I want you to ask me that question again <laughs> in December 2021, because I I am so far removed from the events of the first Avatar mm -hmm. movie that I, I couldn't even give you a good answer to that question. And yes, I have the opportunity to revisit it, but when we're talking about a studio putting that many resources into one single franchise, the fact that it is not going to be fresh in many out there, in many people's minds, I wonder if that's gonna be problematic. For me, uh, yes. <laughs> I think between day 35 and 39 of its release, it'll pass it. I think it's coming up. I think it's going to be very soon. So I think somewhere in there. And I think that Avatar has to be as big of a leap from 2D to 3D as the first one was from 3D into whatever the next thing is. That's 4K. the thing is like, but what what is the evolutionary step? Because the thing that made Avatar so interesting is that it was an event movie. It was a spectacle. It was something that evolutionized 3D and it revolutionized how we had theatrical going experiences. Unless it is a hard stop revolution, it can't can't hit those same numbers. It was an event. Everyone talked about it. People went and saw 20 minutes of it at IMAX because that was all new and exciting. We live yeah. in a world now where a post MCU world where event movies come out three times a year, where Star Wars is back, where all these things are back. Avatar came out in a very different time. Movies were very different then. I don't know if the second one can possibly live up to the first one's expectations. All right. All right. First of all, when people say, oh, it was, it was such a different time. It was only 10 years. It was 10 years. I mean, the MCU was up and running 10 years ago. What was different about the circumstances for Avatar versus Anchor Game, Perry, like you just pointed out, is that Avatar came out in December mm -hmm. and, and Endgame obviously in April. And Endgame is moving into, it's got a lot of competition coming up, but I don't think, I don't think Endgame is going to get a real threat at the box office until Godzilla comes out. I think for the next two weeks, you know, Avengers will pass Avatar. But when mm -hmm. the first Avatar came out, it was like, it was, uh, it was in theaters for eight months. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in, in, into the winter and into the spring when, you know, not a lot of big blockbusters came out, Yeah, you know, uh, and, and still don't. I mean, sometimes they do now because you had Glass, you had Captain Marvel. But uh, to that extent, I mean, it, it was a different period of time. But, you know, movies are still movies. And I, I don't know. I just feel like I couldn't even tell you what the hell Avatar was about. Uh, I definitely would need to go back and watch it again. Um, I'm curious about Avatar 2, but I'm not like, oh my God, I can't I really wait. need to revisit this movie yeah. and then rethink this question. Because I've, <laughs> I've been saying it long enough now that it's time for a rewatch and it should happen. Before we close out the show, I want you guys to look at this release calendar and pick one 
through all these movies that they dated through 2027, one movie that you're most excited to see? Uh, I would say the May release date in 2022 that is Marvel <laughs> because for one very specific you don't know reason, what it is because phase three was ru- for me not ruined but for phase three they released all of that slate and I knew everything that was coming and I was the one guy that was like eh. like I, I like not knowing so right now in this moment not knowing what that May release date is for Marvel <laughs> is the single most exciting thing that can happen to me because it's not anything we've heard of yet so I like being surprised I like event movies I like being overwhelmed by trailers so the furthest Marvel really stayed away is the one I'm most excited for. You're like, for. wow, what could that possibly be? I have no idea. I get, every I get event uh-huh. leads to it. Because uh-huh. uh-huh. Marvel's is cumulative. So every movie in between here and there is going to lead to that moment. Steering clear That's of the exciting. complete unknown, I'm going with New Mutants because of the conversation we just had. I've yeah. been rooting for that movie the day I heard about it, especially after I saw that trailer. I'm rooting for Josh Boone to wind up on top. <laughs> and if what we were just uh, tossing around here winds up proving true, that would be huge. Uh, by the way, if that happens, I'm buying you dinner. I mean, you heard yes, it right please. here. Yeah, I'm buying yes, her dinner. If she does that dinner come she, with a beer? If, yes, it's, of course it does. <laughs> How if do you eat dinner? dinner? Does it come with a beer? I know you <laughs> like your beer. Listen, uh, uh, those are both great choices. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly a lot more excited about New Mutants than I was before I even walked in the store. But the one release date of all these like shuffles and additions that that I'm excited about, and I'm surprised no one's brought this up, not not in this conversation, but anywhere, is the. July 9th, 2021, that was given for the Indiana Jones Hmm. sequel. Like, wait a minute. I'm like scrolling through the list going like, Wait a minute. Dan July Fogelman, 9th, right? 2021, yeah. Indiana Jones sequel? Dan Prob- Fogelman. Well, well, probably a conversation for another day. But <laughs> part of the reason why I didn't pick it is because that is so soon after West Side Story. I just have a feeling that that one's going to get pushed back again. But Spielberg, who's directing both, he's doing West Side Story and Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, he does that. He directs like two movies at a time. He did it with Jurassic Park and Schindler's List. I mean, you know, he did it with, uh, uh, you know, Jaws Minority Report like and Catch Me If You Can. And, okay, yeah. Here, here's how it's working right now. If New Mutants plays out, like I said it would, dinner. I get dinner. Yeah. And if Indiana Jones hits that date, I will return the favor and buy you dinner. Done. If Deal. one of those dates Deal. is Deadpool, I'll buy myself dinner. <laughs> <laughs> this was great. Mans Koi, thank you so much. Great job. You guys are going to get Koi on the show every single Tuesday. And the Mans Man is going to be back very often because we love you, man. Adam in the booth, thank you so much for all your hard work. As always, please do not forget to like and share this episode and keep chiming in on that live chat. We want to know what you think. We also want you to tell everybody you know about us in podcast form because that still exists as well. Guys, you rock. Thanks for supporting the show. We will see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. PT live for a new episode.